for this morning is a penitential order for Holy Eucharist. Right two. We'll continue on page 351 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 351. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. And on the previous page, page 350, the Decalogue. Let's kneel if you're able. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. The Lord have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. The Lord have mercy. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Amen, Lord, Lord, have mercy. Honor your father and your mother. Amen, Lord, Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen, Lord, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen, Lord, Lord, have mercy. You shall not steal. You shall not be a false witness. Amen, Lord, Lord, have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen, Lord, Lord, have mercy. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. And the Trisagion is on page 356 of your prayer book. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. Have mercy on us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You can be seated for the readings. A 
reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. And our psalm for today is a portion of Psalm 51. Let's read it responsively by the half verse, breaking at the asterisk. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, wash me through and through from my wickedness. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak. And you have right in your Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth. A sinner. For behold, you look for truth deep within me. And will make me understand the truth of the Spirit. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness. That the body of your birth may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. And lie. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and Reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, now here we are. We're closer to the, the end of this season of Lent than we are to the beginning of it. Um, I think some people may be relieved about that. Um, we're now the fifth. Sunday in Lent. That means we only have two weeks left of time. And uh, really, if you can't take out the Sundays out of that 12 days of Lent that is left. So now that we're farther into all this thing, it's probably a, a good opportunity for us to kind of look back and see where we've been in terms of the lessons, the scripture lessons that we've had for the past few weeks. So if we go back uh, in time to that very first Sunday in Lent, we will hear the gospel lesson that comes from Mark's gospel, which uh, is his account of Jesus' baptism. And that appropriately marks the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And on that second Sunday in Lent, which is from Mark chapter 8, uh, we were able to hear of Jesus' rebuke of Peter, one of his closest disciples, where he says, get behind me, Satan. Jesus tells Peter that he has his mind set on earthly things rather than divine matters. The third Sunday in Lent, we're witness to the crazy, angry Jesus of the second chapter of John's Gospel, the so-called cleansing of the temple account, here we see Jesus at a time when he is not the Prince of Peace. He is certainly not at peace. And I think that's because he demands authentic worship of God and justice for God's people. And then last week, for the fourth Sunday in Lent, we're privy to a nighttime visit of an important Jewish religious leader, Nicodemus. This is in John chapter 3. Nicodemus goes to see Jesus. Nicodemus is interested in Jesus, although I think he's unsure about what to think about that, certainly a little embarrassed about it, his interest. But Jesus' message to Nicodemus, he is a reassuring one. He reassures him that Jesus comes to save and not to condemn. So now we've arrived on this fifth Sunday in Lent and Jesus' message turns sharper. It is a 
ratcheting up of tension, I think, that we see in this day. Uh, for everybody involved, it's uh, his listeners at the time and for people today, us today. Jesus puts everyone on notice with this message that at some point in time, we do have to decide what it is that we want to believe, what we believe. And we have to decide how our belief, the things that we say we believe, how that will cause us to act. So today's gospel lesson is from John in chapter 12. And um, I think that uh, we can read this lesson, see what it has to offer us for today. And the first thing I think from uh, starting in that verse 20, what we see is the first idea is that we hear that some Greeks approach Philip at the festival of the Passover, and they ask to see Jesus. Now, what you have to understand is this term, the term Greeks refers to basically people who are not, they're, some idea about who these people are. They're not Hebrew Jews, obviously. Um, but it, it indicates people who are outside the Hebrew culture, whether they're Jewish people who uh, speak Greek, which is different from kind of a traditional Hebrew-speaking Greek, or a Gentile, somebody who's not a Jew, um, uh, somebody completely different. Now, we're, we're Gentiles. <laughs> we are not Jews. And so uh, this is really a foreshadowing of the coming of our own faith, these Greeks coming to want to see Jesus, this is like us wanting to come see Jesus, the foreshadowing of that happening. It is a demonstration of Jesus' work, his ministry bearing fruit. Um, it is a, is a sign that his ministry has grown outside of the regular traditional Jewish context and has gotten bigger and more accepted to people outside that small circle the circle has gotten much bigger. Philip, when he hears this news, what does he do? He goes off to tell his friend Andrew because he perceives this is good news that people are wanting to hear about Jesus. This is good news, I guess. Um, he wants to share it with a friend. So he and Andrew go and tell Jesus this news together. Um, and this is where the the good news gets difficult. It gets hard. Because the Greeks coming to the faith, wanting to see Jesus, is precisely the sign that John the evangelist is looking for, as indicating that Jesus' time is coming up short. That his time of walking the earth will soon be over. In fact, if you think about Jesus' specific response to Philip and Andrew, it's really just that. He says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So for the past 12 chapters of John's Gospel, Jesus has performed all manner of signs. You know, he's turned water into wine. He's fed a lot of people thousands of people. He's healed a lot of people. Um, he has walked on water. All of these are signs, I think, which demonstrate who Jesus is. However, starting with the upcoming chapter, chapter 13 of John, um, his, the process of his glorification begins. Um, as the confrontation that he will have with all the earthly powers to be um, and the world is going to come to a head soon enough. What does this mean to us, though? What does this mean to us as followers of Christ? Well, I think that the next three verses do a good job of kind of giving us the idea about what this means for us in terms of how we should be living. Verse 24 of that chapter 12. Jesus uses the symbol of a single grain of wheat dying to produce something, produce results. 
So you can be somebody like me, and you know, I have no earthly idea about farming. Uh, people can tell me, I'm fascinated about hearing about when people talk about growing stuff and being farming, but I have no idea how all that really works. But I can make the connection that if a seed is not planted in good soil, if it's not tended to, if it just sits in that packet that is on the shelf, it just remains what it is. It stays a seed. But when a seed is planted, it might lose that essence in terms of what it is of being a seed, but in turn, that former seed can gain a whole new status as something that's living and growing, a new plant which can bear a lot of new fruit, new seeds out there. So I think the first lesson, one lesson that we can learn today is that if we're followers of Christ, we must be committed to the mission. We have to be invested in the mission. Discipleship requires us to be planted, planted in good soil if we want to achieve growth, if we want to achieve new heights. It's not an accident. In verse 25, the next verse, Jesus gives a message that could be startling to us. He says that people who love their life in this world will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will gain it for eternal life. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I read this, I inevitably kind of, this comparison that's made, I think about the idea that why anybody who hated something would want it for eternal life. That's the first thing I think about. I think, why would you, why would you want it if you hated it? So it makes me think this is not all to the story. There's something nuanced about this, just hearing those words. Because I think this, this is directed to Jesus' followers, the idea uh, of, of hating your life and gaining it for eternal life. Um, I think it can be connected really with Jesus' rebuke of Peter that we heard a few weeks ago. If the message is not about generally hating life, which sounds miserable, and unfortunate, and not a very good thing. But if it's just a way for Jesus to get our attention, because Jesus likes to say outlandish things to get our attention, perhaps we can learn a second lesson, I think, from the, for followers of Christ, another lesson. And I think it's this. Discipleship has to be sacrificial. We should always be prepared to prioritize divine things over earthly matters. It doesn't mean that earthly matters aren't important. It just means that we have to prioritize God first over those earthly matters. If we don't feel that stress between those two worlds that we're in, the earthly world and the divine world that we have, we're probably not being sacrificial we don't feel that pressure between those two things. And we're probably prioritizing our own desires far too much. In verse 26, Jesus tells us, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Now, to this scripture, this has two major implications to me. I think because if Jesus is called, if, he, if Jesus came to serve, I think Jesus says, I came to serve, not to be served, then uh, we must also be called to serve. And um, if we're called to serve, it's fair to say that we're called to look like Jesus. We're called to be like Jesus. Therefore, we must always be prepared to align our actions with what Christ represents. It won't be perfect. It won't be a perfect process. Human beings are not perfect. But it doesn't excuse us and it doesn't absolve us from trying. 
Second, in order to follow someone or something, we have to be present in some manner. At least more often than not, the reality is we cannot be absent from the ministry of Christ. Physically, mentally, spiritually, we can't be absent and serve Jesus. Now we can falsely convince ourselves that we have a sufficient uh, discipleship, that we are doing what we're doing, what is it, it's sufficient. But we have to look at the idea, what are, we, what are we doing with the living of our lives to show that we believe what we say we believe? You know, Jesus doesn't say, well, you can carry your cross to be my disciple unless that's con too inconvenient and then you get a pass um, or you can follow me unless it gets in the way of whatever it is that you want to do. You don't really have to show up. No discipleship is a matter of living a disciplined life. It's a question of acting like Jesus. And whether whatever we think about it or not, it is a ministry of presence. We have to be there to serve Christ in some way. As we get closer to the end of the season of Lent, we learn a difficult truth. And that truth is that Jesus isn't here in our sight to physically guide, direct us, make all the decisions about what it is that we're called to do. We're not told what to do. We're left to decide that for ourselves. And you know what? That can feel daunting to us. Because I think, if you're anything like I am, you're probably wondering whether you have what it takes. Because I wonder if I have what it takes. Well, I have some good news for you. You should understand that we are all plants that are grown from the seed of Christ. We are all plants that are grown from the seed of Christ. And if you look out there in that world, you're going to find Greeks out there in the world who are seeking Jesus. They are still out there in the world seeking Jesus every day. There is still work to be done spreading the gospel in thought, word, and in deed. And it is our calling. It's our calling to spread that gospel, to do just that. In other good news, we are not called to be perfect. We are called to put forth the effort to try to be perfect, to try to be like Jesus. We aren't even called to be successful. We are just called to be faithful people. Can we be faithful? And furthermore, we aren't called to make people do anything. It is their choice about what it is they'll do. But I think we are called to make sure they hear the very best sales pitch that they can get. May we always be planted in this task. May we always sacrificially prioritize God over ourselves. And may we always live a disciplined life that is one of presence. Amen. And if you'll stand with me, if you're able, let us reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. It's on page 358 in your prayer book.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And our prayers to the people. Form two. It's page 385 in your prayer book. Page 385. At the bottom. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For our Bishop Jonathan, for Mother Virginia, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people, pray for the church. Ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God for a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I invite your prayers and intercession, thanksgivings at this time, either silently or aloud. for my prayers for Emmanuel Church, all the people gathered together in this place, people who are watching afar. I ask you to protect them and uh, give them grace and peace and glory and joy in knowing you. <coughs> Pray.
Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have the grace to glorify Christ in our own day. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help, for you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. J.D., I'm the rector here, and uh, good to see you all this morning. Hope that you're having a good day, enjoying that. That was a pretty weather yesterday we had. Um, you know, I, I think I've, uh, I've been very fortunate the time that, that we've uh, been here. The Barnes family's been here for about eight months now, and the weather really hasn't been too bad. So I think it's, it's been pretty nice as far as I was concerned. So um, I... <laughs> I don't know, the snow's not that bad, you know, it, it just is what it is. You've got to have that positive mindset that uh, I think to, to get you off. And I, you know, and I really, the humidity, I think the lack of humidity has been a, people will say, oh, the, you brought the good weather with you from Alabama. Well, Alabama doesn't have very good weather, so <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Uh, it's definitely muggy and buggy down there, so. Uh, just a few announcements that we've got. Uh, um, Actually, a few announcements. You can bear with me. Uh, we um, we're, we still have our breakfast for kids. Uh, uh, Sunday school kids are collecting items for uh, children to have to eat uh, to be presented to the food pantry throughout Lent. Hope you'll support that. Looks like you have because there's a lot of food back there. It's pretty good, too. Um, I think that a lot of good items that will be for young people. But that's uh, that was all out of our Sunday school program. The kids generated that, and that's a good thing. We um, have some envelopes, which I think you might see an envelope in one of your things about Easter flowers, if you're interested in making some type of donation for an Easter flowers to decorate the church as we go from kind of a Spartan Lent into a decorated Easter, then uh, please, uh, you can turn that into the office. We will have um, our EYC group will meet this week, this Wednesday. And uh, we're going to, our primary objective there um, is to hopefully have some fun in making some palm crosses for Palm Sunday. And so I um, hope that you'll uh, put that on your agenda. We'll find something good for you to eat, I'm sure, to, to bribe you to get you there. So uh, that's Wednesday at 530. We have um, something I wanted to point out that I haven't done a really good job of pointing out um, are grocery certificates or food certificates here. Um, we have a, a good program where basically we sell uh, some certificates, basically cards that uh, you can use for groceries at various places around, Safeway and Walmart and uh, Family Fair, I think it's the other. And um, so you can choose which place that you go. You know you're going to have to buy groceries, so um, there's a, a portion of this actually goes to help church response, and uh, a portion of it actually stays with a manual. So. Um, you know, if you've got a big family and you have to buy a lot of groceries, you've got a lot of teenagers, you know they're going to eat a lot of food. So um, I think that uh, this is some, a good thing for the church and a good thing for the community. So I, I will recommend that to you. I think there's something, anything that I missed in particular. Outreach meeting, yes. 
outreach meeting, um, I know that some of, some of you might not be able to, you might have a, a job that conflicts or school or whatever. I think we're going to try to record that, um, hopefully at least so that we'll have it available for people who are not uh, able to be there. So we're going to work on that and see if we can do that. That's 3.30, I think, tomorrow. Is that right? 3.30? Uh, in the uh, parish hall. Okay. Well, next uh, Sunday, Palm Sunday, we'll... Uh, we will have a, we will have a, we'll actually process. We'll start in our parish hall for the services and have a procession. If you'd rather not, if you'd rather just take your place in the church and go ahead and sit down, that would be okay too. But we'll act, actually have a little procession around to the door of the church. Uh, so that'll be next week. So if you uh, are interested, gather in the, the parish hall before the service or make your way in here and have it, go ahead and have a seat. I think that's all, probably more than you wanted to hear, uh, but want to keep you in the know. So anyway, good to see you this morning. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Eucharistic Prayer C. You can find that on page 369 in your prayer book. Eucharistic Prayer C. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, we were created and have everything we need. 
From the primal elements you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord, for we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood he reconciled us, by his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hand. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take. Eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers and our mothers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Amen. Risen Lord, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Now that the Savior Christ has called us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
365 in your prayer book. Page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, in the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you this day and remain with you forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.